Good evening, morning, afternoon, distinguished guests, speakers, ladies and gentlemen, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to our webinar, From Mediocrity to World Class, with Professor William Hazeltine as our guest speaker. I'm Hui Kun, your MC for today. Everyone is muted on entry, but you will have a chance to ask questions later during the discussion session. I would first like to invite our chairman of the NUS Medicine International Council, Professor Kishore Mabubani, to give his welcome remarks. Prof Mabubani, please. Uh, thank you, Hui Kun. Uh, I must say it's a real great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor William Hasseltine. And I was going to mention to you, Bill, that this is actually the first time that I'm speaking publicly in my capacity as chairman of this council. And there's no better way to begin my career as chairman of this council than to introduce an old friend uh, like you, because uh, I think you remember we first met about uh, 30 years ago when I was in Harvard as a fellow at the Center for International Affairs. And we had a chat then, I remember it was about HIV AIDS and how we could collaborate together. And then we, our paths kept crossing. And as you were discussing just before the session began, uh, you and I last met in this beautiful, exotic apartment of the former foreign minister of Egypt, Nabil Fami in Cairo. <laughs> so it's a small world when someone from Singapore and someone from the US uh, meet in Cairo and, and stay in touch uh, with each other. And in some ways, that's sort of symbolic of where the world is heading. Because if you look, if I look at the 72 years of my life, I would say 2020 will rank clearly as one of the most challenging, if not the most challenging year of my life. And of course, COVID-19 just shut down humanity. And even today, as we speak, we are still struggling to get out of it. And to get out of it, it's very clear that humanity needs to make a serious mind change. We still believe we live within countries, within borders, but all these viruses don't care about borders. They travel from one end of the world to the other end of the world. And despite the clear message that we live in one world, we're still busy protecting our countries, not protecting humanity as a whole. But to protect humanity as a whole, we really need now uh, global health ambassadors who understand the world of health very well and also the world of, in a sense, politics very well. And Bill, you've been trained all your life to, have, to become a global health ambassador. So I wish you even greater success in the coming years as we come together to deal with this common challenge. I know that's not what you're going to talk about, but I think it'd be wonderful to have your voice be heard louder and louder. And in this regard, I must say, I was delighted to learn from you that you'll be getting your vaccine in seven hours time. Uh, I'm getting my vaccine in 14 hours time. I hope the fact that you and I are being vaccinated around the same time means that we'll meet again, maybe in Cairo, maybe in Davos, maybe in somewhere else. So thank you again, once, uh, once again, Bill, for delivering this lecture. We're looking very much to listening to you. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Prof Mabuvani. I would now like to invite Prof Weiju Wee Cheng, our host for today, and Vice Dean Research at NUS Medicine to start off the discussion. Weiju, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Hui Kun, and a uh, very good evening, good morning, good afternoon to all who are joining us on this uh, webinar. It is my uh, honor and pleasure to introduce uh, our speaker uh, for this evening's uh, seminar, Professor William Hasseltine, uh, who has a prolific career in science, business, and philanthropy around the world. Uh, he was previously a professor at the Harvard Medical School and Harvard School of Public Health. And he's well known for his uh, pioneering work on cancer, HIV, AIDS, as well as uh, genomics. He has founded more than a dozen biotechnology companies, including Human Genome Sciences, and he has served on advisory board for numerous international entities from the Brookings Institution to the Council of Foreign Relations. He has authored more than 200 manuscripts in peer reviewed journal and authored more than a dozen books in particular, uh, he has written a book on the Singapore healthcare system, so he does know us uh, very well. He has also written a book called World Class, which will be, you know, to some extent, the focus of uh, this uh, evening's discussion about the transformation of NYU Langoons 
as a showcase for um, how academic medicine may transform healthcare. He, his recent autobiography, My Lifelong Fight Against Disease, was meant to inspire the young amongst us uh, to take on the challenges of uh, really a career in academia. And most recently, he has written a series of books on COVID-19, all of it very informative, um, including the latest uh, called Variants, The Shape-Shifting Challenge of COVID-19. So he's really at the forefront and very current um, uh, in, in, uh, uh, in the setting of healthcare and healthcare transformation. Professor Hesseltin um, is currently the chair and president of Access Health uh, Internationals Incorporated, uh, as well as chairman of the Hesseltin Foundation for Science and Arts. Uh, so without much further ado, it's my pleasure to welcome Professor Hesseltin. Uh, very welcome to the webinar and over to you to deliver your lecture. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And it's a uh, great pleasure uh, to speak to you in Singapore and beyond. Um, let me begin with the very first book that I wrote uh, in this series of what we can do to make sure the world has better health. One of the things that had, I'd realized after being a research scientist, uh, creating companies, bringing drugs to the market, was that the world was suffering from access, lack of access to high quality medical care that today, back then and today, it remains unequal. It's not distributed equally. We have many wonderful uh, treatments, cures, and means to prevent disease, which are not evenly distributed around the world and even within countries. And it's occurred to me that one of the things that I could do with this part of my life was to do whatever I could to help equalize high quality, affordable, accessible health care to everyone in the world. How can you do that with a relatively small foundation? Small compared to some of the really big ones like the Gates Foundation. And I had a couple of good examples. One was the Lasker Foundation, a rather small foundation. They rewrote American health care. You do that by helping influence policy, government policy. Government is the ultimate power to change health. And if the policy is a good policy, you can get good health. If the policy is imperfect, you will have imperfect health. I also learned that from other examples, the Brookings Institution. Our goal is to improve American governance through changing policies. And over the years, we've been more or less successful in doing just that by placing a number of our key scholars and researchers in important positions. And so that is the strategy that I decided uh, to follow, that a small group can make a big difference if you have the ear of policymakers. So the very first study that I did was to look around the world for the best examples in healthcare. And the one I chose was Singapore. You won't be surprised that the title of the book is called Affordable Excellence. Affordable Excellence. Why such a title? Well, the world should know that Singapore has amongst the top 10 medical results in the world, longer life, better health for almost all of your citizens. And you've done that through a very long process. I read the biographies of Lee Kuan Yew and how he decided to do that. I've talked to people who've been in your ministries, including your ministers of health, for over 35 years working diligently to improve the health of your people, to make sure that everybody in the country had access to high quality health. And as a result of that, you do have great health. And in addition to that, you do it at about a quarter of the US cost per capita. You're a high income country, yet you deliver highest quality health at the lowest cost per capita in the world for high quality outcomes. How did you do that? And so I wrote the book about the kind of decisions uh, that were made a long time ago and then systematically implemented. I've gone on to write a number of other case studies, book length case studies. The one that you've asked me to talk about today is one here in the United States. Here we have excellent care at one level, but our overall performance is dreadful. 
We are two standard deviations below our medical outcomes, our health outcomes in, amongst OECD countries. It used to be we're in the top five in the 50s. We're now number 34 or 35th, below some rather small countries like the Dominican Republic, we're right equal. I and mean, that's just not acceptable. How did that happen? Well, part of it happened because we don't have equitable health distribution. But it also happens because the systems we were using are antiquated, they're balkanized, they are not efficient. So I set about trying to find the best system I could, and it happened right here in the city where I live in Manhattan at NYU Langone. And it's a remarkable story. And it's remarkable from several effect, uh, points of view. First of all, I told you I focus on government policy. Well, NYU Langone decided to do it without changing government policy. So that's a little bit paradoxical. But in fact, they decided how can we be the best we are in the environment in which we exist? We can't change the environment, but we can change ourselves. And why did they decide to do that? They had been one of the outstanding academic and medical centers in the United States 30 years, 40 years ago, and they just slid downhill. And they were about to go bankrupt, really bankrupt. If they hadn't been patent income from a marvelous drug one of their scientists had invented, they would have been bankrupt. Not only would have they been bankrupt, but they were uh, the bottom third in quality and uh, safety according to this international and national standards in the US. Uh, they had very low income for scientists that was working and they'd fallen down the teaching rankings to about number 40 in the US. So they decided to turn it around. They got a great leader and this is a case length study, a, a, a book length study, a case study of exactly how they did it. And a couple of really important lessons. The first was to focus on the patient experience. What is it like for a patient? Everything they do is patient centered. Every measurement they make is on the quality of the outcome and the patient's perspective of the quality. The chairman of the board, Ken Langone, ran a big commercial operation, Home Depot. And he had realized that what's essential for quality is first of all, dedication. And he believed there were high quality dedicated physicians just in the wrong system. But that's the first key to make sure everybody from that person who opens the door to the janitor, to the nurse, to the doctor, to the administrator are dedicated to quality. That they're all on the same page. And that was a cultural change. The second was to pick a good leader, somebody who understood medicine and science and had a drive to make everything the best. And then to make sure the board and the leader were in synchrony. That's hard to do because the board of a hospital like NYU, an academic medical center, is made up of billionaires who are friends with the doctors and some of those doctors you have to change. And so, it was Ken Langone working very closely, and that's the first lesson. Most people don't focus on how important a board is in changing the quality, but it's really important. You have to have that synchrony. Second, you have to change culture. You have to make sure everybody is not complacent, everybody strives for excellence, that no matter how good you are, you can get better. No matter how complex a system you work in, you can get better. The next thing to do was to realize you needed information to do that. And the CEO, uh, Bob Grossman, said to me, when he took the job, the first thing he realized is he was flying a big airplane blind with no data. He didn't know where they were going. He didn't have the actual data. And he worked for a few months and finally he decided he had to change the whole crew and really get serious about information. And over the next five, six years, they dedicated an enormous amount of effort and so knowing exactly what's happening, when it's happening. So what kind of information system do they have? Today, it's fully integrated. There is no interface between any data and the information system. That's a hard thing to do. No interface at all. Teaching, research, patient care, heart monitor, you name the piece of equipment. If a new hire wants to come in and bring his own equipment that isn't fully interface free, 
interdigitated with their information system, they don't hire him or her. That is how serious they are. Information, real-time information, and I mean real-time, like minute-to-minute -minute information, is totally transparent across the entire system. And it wasn't built by healthcare specialists. It was built by information technology specialists that came in from the investment banking business together with some of the best people, Epic in particular, working very, very closely. So today they have not only minute to minute outcomes, and they can tell you how many minutes each person has been waiting in the emergency room, for example. They have a, a board that shows that, they show where they go. Uh, they have amazing information. So that, that's what really struck me when I first looked at it. I, um, at the system. I went into the room and looked at the information system. And you could see, for example, hip replacements. How many units of blood were used for each operation, what the average was per surgeon, and how it varied per surgeon. <coughs> and they could get it right down to the, the last surgery. And if you wanted, you could look right into the patient record from the CEO's office. And that goes through the whole system. They also have financial accounting. They know to the penny how much it costs for the fixed and variable cost per patient, per, per procedure. And that allows them, and they have a whole unit now that modifies procedure and looks at outcomes and costs. And they measure the patient satisfaction. The other thing is really important is horizontal transparency, real, real time and horizontal transparency. So if you're a, go back to the hip surgeon, you can look at the other hip surgeon's numbers and you are ranked clearly ranked who in whatever category they want to see, whether it's how many patients you see, how many times the patients have had to come back, what the infection rates are, what the blood usage rate is, what equipment you had in your surgical kit. All of that is transparent. That's a degree of transparency most people don't understand. The next thing they did is apply exactly the same thing to research. They used metrics to look at research. That is a surprise. They actually, if you go there, you'll have a, a wall of fame and a wall of shame. How many grants everybody gets, how many papers they publish, how many they submit and how many are turned down. All of that is horizontally transparent. They give special bonus rewards of grants and money to the researchers if they have big cooperative projects. Focus on improving patient care, for example. Research that uses the advanced surgeons and the biomechanical research efforts, the bioengineering efforts, they focus on integrated research and medicine, extremely important. And for teaching, they don't just give you a grade. They let you know what each question tested you for, for memory, logical, imagination, and they rank you on each question versus your peers. It's a total information environment. That tells you that they're focused on quality. They're focused on the patient experience. They're focused on all three missions, research, teaching, and patient outcome. And that's how they got to be number one in the country for three years in a row in quality and safety. That's how they went from 40 to number three in the country in medical school rankings. That's how they got from one of the lowest dollars per capita for their researchers to the highest in the country for NIH support, all in a period of 10 years. And that's how they went from about going bankrupt to a surplus of over a billion dollars a year. That kind of control has allowed them to cope with unexpected disasters. We had a hurricane that wiped them out, flooded their basements. Every patient had to scoot and get out. It was a total disaster. They recovered and were back in operation in four months. In Tulane, it took them four years. They made really good decisions. They decided to pay everybody full salary until they came back, even though, and how could they do that? Because they'd been saving for a rainy day. They knew that rainy days were coming. And in this current pandemic, the COVID pandemic, they've been amazing. They had all the supplies already stocked up for a pandemic response 
They didn't have to scramble like the rest of the institutions here had to scramble to make up. They pioneered medical technologies and have the lowest death rate in the country for COVID patients. And by the way, their in-hospital death rate is half that of the other best institutions and almost one third of that of most of the institutions here in this very city. So they couldn't change the US government. They couldn't change the New York state government. And they certainly couldn't change the city government, but they did something remarkable. And it's something that I hope most other people can learn from because it's a general process. It is not specific. They did something else that was truly amazing. And that is from the very beginning, they bucked the trend for consolidation into big hospitals. They said, we're not gonna buy other hospitals, we're just gonna buy a huge problem. That we're gonna have to sell. We're gonna build outpatient clinics. And in 15, in 10 years, 12 years now, they have built something like 500 outpatient clinics. 80% of all their surgeries are day surgeries. The quality that they get is extremely high. As I said, the highest, amongst the highest in the country. And that also saves a tremendous amount of money. They're now working to move forward, to integrate that kind of care into the, house, into the home. Now, nobody, <clears throat> nobody's perfect. They haven't done all the integration. If you look to the future, most care is gonna go into the home, then to the clinic, then to the outpatient, then to the central hospital. It's gotta be coordinated through a central hospital, a central teaching and research hospital. That's where the coordination has to be. That's the brain. But most of the activity, just like in our bodies, is in the periphery. If the brain is working, the periphery can work. And if you insist on quality at every measure and accountability, not based on impression, based on data, accountability based on data, you can achieve excellence. Let me just give you another example. Two years or three years ago now, they bought a failing, what we call safety net hospital. Safety net means, and this is turns out right here in our city, we have the highest uninsured Medicaid, Medicare, count uh, uh, a zip code in the, in the country, in the entire country. It's not in Appalachia, it's here in our city. They took a hospital in the center of that, took it over, and in two years, it outperformed by excellent standards, even their standards in patient satisfaction and quality because they put in these systems. And from losing money and going bankrupt, they didn't make it a big profit center, but they made it a little bit better than break even which for a safety net hospital, treating many uninsured patients is a really impressive task. And the quality is exceptional in that hospital. And I've talked to, like I've had taxi drivers say, oh, you're interested in NYU? I can tell you wonderful stories about my family. And they go on and tell me wonderful stories about the transformation of their grandmother, taking their Arabic speaking grandmother to the hospital and how wonderful that experience was as compared to what it had been. So these are the things that can be done. And I have to say, I'm not particularly happy with the response to my book. I talked to the head of one of the unnamed major hospital books. There are only three or four, so you can think about which one it might be here in New York City. And he said, I don't want to read your book. I said, what? You don't want to learn? Nope, we're doing fine. They weren't doing fine. That's a hospital that's even a little bit lower on the uh, in-hospital death rate. They could afford to learn, uh, but not everybody wants to learn. I handed it to uh, Michael Bloomberg. And he, I said, he said, why did you write this book? I said, people could learn. He said, Bill, why do you think people want to learn? Well, they should want to learn. And I'm very happy to be able to speak to a group like you who does want to learn. You are a great place both to teach the world how to do better. But I, one of the things I found about Singapore is you, like NYU, always want to do better. You're not satisfied with where you are. Let me just close with one other comment. And that is, I took a big lesson away from the book on Singapore. And that is, as well as you had done in the past, you were facing new challenges, 
demographic challenges. And that inspired me to write a series of books on how people can deal with the demographic challenge. You know, it's very different treating a younger population from treating an older population. Older people need to be mostly in their homes, but they have chronic diseases. Uh, you can't basically treat them in a hospital-centric way. You have to have the hospitals for them. Uh, but you've got to look at the problem differently. And I know that you have been struggling with that problem. You've been working on it for many years. You're amongst the leaders in thinking through those problems. But they're not easy solutions. But they are amenable to the kind of changes that I described in World Class information technology, distributed care, accountability. You know, one of the things you see today in COVID is how poorly the world is handling the elder care. Sticking these old people in warehouses is a recipe for death. We have seen that. Something like 90% of people who have died have died in long-term care facilities in the United States. What a tragedy. And this won't be the last one. And I'll bet if we look back, we'll see how these failed us before. You know, when I wrote about the healthcare system in Sweden and the elder care system, they weren't doing very well, although on the whole, they were doing really well for, not for their elder care. These are really serious problems that we have to think through very, very carefully. And let me say there's one other thing I'd like to say, and that is COVID is teaching us a lot of lessons. It's taught us we have to rethink how we treat our elder care in many uh, countries. But it's also teaching us about our public policies. And as much as we talk about peripheralizing healthcare and getting it into the homes, that isn't gonna do the job in a pandemic. The Chinese had thought it through a little bit more carefully than many others. They realized they didn't wanna sacrifice medical care, standard medical care in times of pandemic. So they had put together an entire emergency hospital system. It was called Fangang. They had already put on paper, if we have a crisis, let's not oh, flood our hospitals. Let's build new pandemic hospitals. Well, that's a good lesson for everybody. You know, I went back and looked at that history of the United States and we used to do the same. What, the United States used to do that? Yes, during the bomb shelter era, we had stand up hospitals already sitting in trucks, waiting to be deployed instantly should a big hospital center be bombed out. Well, that was pretty advanced thinking for the time. And there were there's videos to show you how those hospitals can get set up in hours. Well, who is doing that? Are we doing that today? No, are you? I think it's something that we've seen because when you look at the numbers of people who are dying today of COVID, a lot of people aren't dying because they got COVID. They're dying because they don't get care because COVID has pushed every other kinds of health care out of the way. And so people with chronic diseases are really suffering, especially mental disease. And maybe that's where I'll end. That is, we really have to get much more serious about how to handle cognitive and mental disorders because you can't warehouse them as well. It's a much more difficult problem. And I don't think it's been fully understood and coped with anywhere in the world. You in Singapore have an opportunity uh, to really focus that and get world-class in that kind of treatment. I could talk about many other things, but I'm happy to uh, open it up to uh, questions. I hope this has been helpful. Thank you so much for that fantastic uh, presentation. Um, we're now gonna start our discussion time. Uh, before we uh, go into the discussion, I just want to let the um, participants know that they could ask uh, questions two ways. One is to use the raise hand function uh, and we'll uh, try to unmute you to allow you to ask the questions live. Uh, for others, they can post their questions uh, under the Q&A tab as well and we'll try as best as we can to um, uh, address uh, all uh, your questions. So um, maybe I'll, I'll start uh, with a couple of questions. So you are absolutely right. The Singaporeans like to learn, and I can uh, say that in uh, our health system, NUHS, we actually pick your book as a, as a book to study for all the leaders uh, because we were embarking on this very serious journey to uh, try to really establish ourselves as an academic uh, medical uh, health system. Um, 
But as I read the book, there are many lessons, as you said, uh, that are important for us to take away from that. But I, nevertheless, I get a feeling that in some sense, it almost seems like a perfect storm um, coming together because they have the right leader, they have the right board, there is investment because the IT transformation is you know, a very costly uh, effort. And do you think this is something that could happen in the public healthcare institution, as you know, uh, with your experience uh, in Singapore? Because uh, if we just took one piece of the lesson and try to apply it, would it work as well as you know, if we have the whole package together? I think that's uh, something that uh, was uh, in my mind uh, as well. Maybe you, you can let us know your thoughts on that. Uh, I would say a couple of things. First of all, I think you need all three pieces working together. If you want to be truly excellent, you have to have the best minds in the world from your researchers across the board. I'm not just talking about fundamental research. I'm talking about clinical research as well. You have to have the best minds there because the best will demand the best and that will infuse throughout your entire institution. And I think that's important to have both excellence in teaching research and clinical care. They go together and try to make sure and incentivize people to work together for the benefit of the patient. That's the first thing to say. The second is you need really that uniform information system. You can't have, and my understanding is Singapore is divided into three groups. And I know when I was there 10, 15 years ago, you were focused on trying to get a uniform information system, but it's been difficult. That is really important. And I think you have an advantage you have a government which is paying for a huge amount of the, the care, you can uh, integrate and have the same kinds of standards. Uh, I would suggest that it's important to do all of it together. You can't do it piecemeal. And you need to have the whole system fully interface-free integrated. That is so important in getting real-time data it's the data system that allowed the decisions to be made. I just to give you an example. Based on the data, they replaced 30 of the 32 department chairs and replaced three of those after a while. Based on data, not based on personality or anything else, just what the data showed. That's the kind of thing you've got to be prepared to do. And in terms of uh, leadership, you're gonna have opposition. And you need to have a very, in, in Singapore, you're gonna to have to have a very tight interface between the government and policymaking leaders and the leaders of the medical center to get that done. It doesn't take many people, but it takes the right people and the right determination to do it. Now, you could say Ed Ryu Langone had his back against the wall. Their decision was to hive off the medical school altogether. Well, you don't have a choice in Singapore. You're not gonna give your health system to anybody else. You've got to deal with it yourself. And if you want the excellent results, you've got to be willing to do that hard work to make sure that uh, every aspect is aligned and you find the people, you have the people. You know, I have uh, infinite respect for the quality. And I know that you're beginning to look for quality at the very youngest ages too. You're beginning to do what the Russian gymnasts used to do, which pick them at five, six years old who can run through hoops faster than the other little kitties. And they're the ones you promote. Well, you're doing that with management at a very young age. Uh, and I think that's for you. You have the quality. You have the people. Uh, you know, I have enormous respect for some of the people on this call, as well as, uh, as the quality of people you have in your government. So I think if anybody can do it, you can. Thank you very much for those remarks. Uh, I think one of the most striking thing in the book is about the, the data, right? The data uh, that they have built uh, and also how they use the data. So I have a question from a colleague, uh, particularly about uh, one aspect that you've mentioned in your address, which is this thing about horizontal data transparency. Um, how successful has it really been? You know, I think you've mentioned a few times it has been instrumental in helping to change uh, the department heads and, and so on, and in a very objective way, right? Um, but the, the key is really, is it something that is, has been deemed to be very successful and is it still practiced today? It is definitely practiced today. And uh, in my interviews, not only with the leadership, with the people in the trenches, what it's done is helped narrow the difference in performance. It turns out 
that, you know, I've run a big company. I can tell you when you're running a commercial enterprise, you may have a small cadre of people that have your passion, but most people are there for a job. So they want to feed their families, very respectable. That's not true in the health professions. Most everybody in the health profession is there because they want to do a good job. They just don't may, and in the absence of information, it's natural to think you are doing a good job. What this has done is allowed people in different parts of the enterprise doing basically the same job to measure themselves against their peers. And the net result is there's a desire from those who aren't doing quite as well to do even better and to learn from those who are doing the best. It's a learning experience and opportunity to improve yourself. How do you get away with using less blood? How come your patients aren't coming back infected? What is it you're doing? What do you really need in your surgical kit? What are these techniques? So surgery is one thing, but it, you can do it across the board. Who's doing best and can we narrow the, the variation toward the highest end? The other thing you can do with that information is compare apples to apples. You're doing A, take this group and do B and see what the cost and outcomes are for, in terms of patient satisfaction and quantifiable outcomes. When you have that real-time information system and you compare across boards, it really works. And it turns out it works for the researchers. Big surprise is some researchers say, I don't wanna be judged that way, I'm not coming here. A lot of really good researchers do come. That's why they're getting the highest grants per capita from the NIH today. And they do come and they are competitive. We're competitive people. If this guy's getting, I remember when I was a professor, I didn't look at what was happening at MIT. I looked at what was happening right in the data farmer and who was getting more grants than me. I knew I was being judged on dollars per square foot that I brought in its overhead. And I wanted to be the winner. It turned out I was number two, not number one, but I worked hard to be number one because I knew what the other guy was getting. I knew how many papers they were publishing. Uh, so that is the kind of thing that you use our natural human instincts to try to get to be the best we can be. And information helps, doesn't hurt. Um, I think there were quite a lot of questions related to the importance of leadership, um, the importance of um, change management, uh, as well as how to manage the sometimes conflicting tension between academia, which the School of Medicine may want to focus more on, versus the um, financial bottom line that the hospital may want to focus more on. Um, and I think these were sort of addressed in the book, but you know, not all our audience may have read the book, so perhaps you could um, give us some insights into the, the key aspects of uh, this three element that is important. Well, I think with leadership, there's inevitable qualities of leadership. The man that they picked, Bob Grossman, had no real experience of being a leader. Uh, and how did they pick him? It took, uh, it took Ken Langone to understand that this man had real talent, understanding business and, want, and being interested in business, as well as excellence in medicine. And the way he saw that is he saw how he came in and managed and turned around his department, how he made a deal with one of the big manufacturers to uh, to get a $200 million credit for being a sole supplier for radiation equipment. He saw that this man had some exceptional talents and then he completely backed him. Now, it's important to get a leader that has the fire to be the best and has the capabilities of doing that. And that is a very hard thing to do. But I would say something that's critically important that most universities get wrong. They're now beginning to get it better. And one of your great leaders from Singapore, uh, whom you know quite well, Rangakrishna, has taken these lessons to heart. And now he's become, and, and the point is, don't have a separate leader for your medical school, your research unit, and your medicine. One CEO. Because if you have two, one for medicine and research, or one for medicine and one for research, you use the same people in both functions, and they're going to try to game the system. That's human nature. They're going to try to get something from this guy and something from that guy. And then these two guys are going to fight and you're going to have a problem. And so you need unified leadership across the entire spectrum. You need one CEO. I mentioned Ranga because he's now the one CEO for research, teaching and medical care 
and expansion for the Russian Medical School. One person that reports to the board. You need that unity and many schools don't have that. Now, unfortunately, I don't think Harvard will ever have that because of its deep history and its uh, complicated way. And what is the result? The result is they spend billions and billions and billions in health information systems and they have a very poor system. They just don't have it because they don't have unified leadership. You in Singapore have the opportunity for unified leadership. I would suggest it's time to take that advantage of your position and do that. Because if you don't, you're gonna have a lot of conflicts. You'll have conflicts getting there, but once you're there, you'll be in a much better place. Great, Th thanks very much uh, um, for, for that. I think that's definitely very true. Um, I think we do have quite a number of participants that are from uh, the region where perhaps um, the resources may not be as rich as say, you know, uh, in Singapore. And you mentioned about healthcare access uh, early on uh, in your address. Um, how do you think this issue, for example, something as specific as access to some anti-cancer drugs, right? I mean, some, something as basic as that. Um, the access is clearly very uneven around the world and uh, many parts of our region are struggling for things like access uh, uh, to, to, to treatment for cancer. How do you think these issues can be uh, solved um, or, or can be addressed through uh, academia or, or other ways and how can the region be helped uh, in, in, in these aspects? Well, actually the foundation I have, Access Health International works on that issue through uh, FinTech for Health. And we've written a number of white papers on that subject, but there's a more general answer. You know, when I was looking at uh, cost across the board in the world, I think the clearest statement that came out was from several Asian countries that said, we control cost by controlling price. Simple statement, but a very powerful statement. And one which I hope someday we in the US could do. Look at what China is now, right now today doing on the cost of medicines. I'm sure you're aware of what they're doing. And they're going to control the cost of healthcare by controlling the price of medicines. And if you look at Japan, they regularly control the price of medicine, the price of uh, doctors and medical fees and the cost of institutional support. They review that on a three, rolling three year basis and they get pretty good cost control results. Not as good as yours, but they get pretty good cost control results at an at a, at affordable price. So I think one of the answers to cancer treatment is price control of cancer drugs. Now that's hard to achieve on a world standard, but it's extremely important. And it's nowhere more important than the United States who we pay outrageous amounts of money. But there's another answer that I would offer for countries that are uh, have uh, less bargaining power, less maybe let's say less resources. I did a deep study of a program and it's where I last saw uh, uh, Kishore was in uh, Egypt, a program called 100 Million Healthy Lives with a very small grant, relatively small for the whole country, $250 million a, a loan from the World Bank. They started a program called 100 Million Healthy Lives and they created an infrastructure of 10,000 testing centers and I visited them where they tested everybody in the country over the age of 12 and over, everybody, prisons, everybody, for diabetes, hepatitis C, hypertension, and obesity, and offered free treatment. It was initially designed to control hepatitis C, which was the highest incident in the country due to their history of using contaminated needles on young children. But they eliminated hepatitis C because they made a free treatment. The, the cost, let me just give you an idea of the cost. The cost was 50 cents for a finger stick to know whether you had antibodies to hepatitis C. $5 for the PCR, Roche PCR, $5. And $30 for a treatment in the United States, which cost $80,000. That allowed them to rid their country of hepatitis C the most infested country in the world and begin to control diabetes, hypertension uh, and obesity. Now they've gone on to do that for cervical screening, for 
papilloma. They've gone on to do that for breast cancer screening and other programs. That is a grassroots, and they had, everybody who was there had a tablet. And the information that came out of that was instantaneous. You knew who, I was watching it develop, and you could watch every day. The numbers go up, the treatments go up. It was, and they did things like how to make sure that everybody got it well. They circulated, a rumor turned out to be false, that unless you got your certificate that you'd been tested, you couldn't get a driver's license. Okay, very simple things. But they got everybody in the country tested. Now, it's, that took presidential leadership. And that can be done. And now it's being done and rolled out in other countries in the region. So those are the kind of, pro I would like to see that program be done in most countries. Fundamental screening for the chronic diseases and free sponsored. Now, how do you actually do the treatment? Turned out most of the treatment was done in a quasi government setting. There had been a group of uh, liver specialists who for years had set up their own liver testing treatment for hepatitis C and they were paid for by the government. Most of the treatment was done through those quasi governmental uh, clinics. But those are the kinds of things that countries with limited resources, and there are many like Kazakhstan, for example, or Mali are now doing similar programs. It can be done and it doesn't take very much. Uh, and there are international organizations. I know the AAIB is now working on those kinds of models. I'm working with the people at AIB, trying to have them understand what happened in, in Egypt and how can it be applied throughout the region that, that they uh, are interested, which is not too far from your region. Thank you. Um, a few of our colleagues um, have posted questions related to new technologies and you know the cost of innovations, I guess, today is that uh, all the new technologies, AI, new medical equipments, new drugs um, are really, really uh, very expensive, right? So um, how do we manage this? And, and actually one of the biggest concern in the Singapore healthcare system is about the rising cost of healthcare. Um, so how, how could we address uh, these issues and, and is actually using uh, cutting edge technology as an important way forward uh, for academic health system or in fact for the health system in general or, or do we have better strategy to actually select and, and focus on, on what are the technologies we adopt? Uh, you need a health technology assessment group, for sure, in all of these things. What is the cost benefit uh, of what you're doing? And it, many times these technologies are helpful. Let's take robotic surgery. You can look at robotic surgery in many different ways. As far as I can tell so far, it's not a huge advance. Some people may argue, I know that the, I may be talking to some robotic surgeons who would argue differently, but I think if you really look at the outcome, it's really not. In terms of AI, AI, if it's spread across the entire system, is not that expensive. And the best way to use it is as an aid. For example, it can, like, what are people doing with AI right now? If you're in a doctor's office, rather than having the doctor looking at his screen and typing, the new system will be an AI system that actually writes up the doctor's unit from a video plus listening in and then making its own decisions about what should be in that record and the doctor just has to check it. So those are the kinds of things that it can make everybody's life better. And what AI actually does is give doctors prompts. You know, have you actually thought of this? And you actually have to do something uh, and it can improve, it can, so the investment, if it's done thoughtfully, but you have to have a unit which is always looking at the cost benefit. The benefit is to the patient. The benefit of the system is to the cost. So those are the things you have to constantly monitor. And then you have to look at where your real costs are. What really costs the most, the system, is people. What can you do to get more function out of the people? If you look at any budget that I've looked at, it's not only the drugs, it's the people costs. You wanna make sure that the people that you're using are used to their best and highest value so that whoever you have is doing a best job and doing it efficiently. And so I think that efficiency monitoring with care, you don't wanna 
make sure that people see other patients for too short. You've got to make it easier for the patient-doctor interaction because at the end, you're going to be measuring what people think has been the benefit, what the real benefit is from you, the physician's point of view, but what the benefit is from the person's point of view. And it's got to be an integrated function. So you can't get too strict on it. But the other, I, I think that many of these new technologies, now when it comes to a lot of the drugs, I have to be very careful with accepting international pricing. I think the world has to get together. You know, what business in the world has 80 to 90% profit margins? Very few, only the pharmaceutical industry. And they justify that based on high costs of research. Well, it turns out, if you really look at it, most drugs are developed by small countries, countries, co companies at a lower cost. And then they're bought by these bigger companies that make a, a bloody fortune on markuping up the prices. Well, I think that isn't the way forward. It isn't what we researchers want to happen with our drugs. Not at all. We would like the drugs that we, we find to be available to most people. And most countries want that too. So I think that's something that not one country can do, but groups of countries together can do, or a big country like China or India can do. They've done a pretty good job. <laughs> you know, you could do worse than uh, link your prices to the Chinese prices. You do a lot better on a lot of equipment and drugs. Thanks very and much. To the international standard. Yep, I think those are very relevant and very true, actually. We can move on and, and ask uh, you a couple of uh, questions uh, about COVID. We do have some uh, who have posed a question on the vaccine. Um, you know, uh, so from uh, Alessandro Perotta, um, is the mRNA vaccine really safe, knowing we do not have any prior data? And what are potential effects on humans? Uh, most articles about this topic are very elusive at best. I, I think everyone is sort of a slightly concerned about these new class of vaccines. Uh, and um, uh, what are your thoughts on this? Well, I was pretty skeptical to begin with, but my skepticism is waning very rapidly and I'm about to get one. <laughs> okay, so that's <laughs> waning. Uh, but uh, it turns out that it's a wonderful technology for some things and probably not so great for others. But in this particular case, they've got a magic formula because the RNA goes in and apparently, and I've just looked at this in great detail, the most antigenic pieces pulled up, we're very lucky. The, the target, the receptor binding domain in other parts, folds up very readily. This thing just wants to be together in the right confirmation. Uh, and that's not true of most antigens, but it is true of this one. It's just magic. You put the RNA in, protein comes out in exactly the right confirmation, and it's there for a while. For example, there are a whole set of reactions where you actually, some people get a shot, hurts a little bit. Next week, they get a big red spot. What's that? That's all the protein coming out and your body beginning to recognize it. I've just seen a paper where people look at the antigen profile. They're actually very sensitive. You can measure the antigen right after the shot. You see it go up, 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 up. Antibodies kick in, boom. Give it another shot, it goes up, up, up. And then whammo, you get very high second boost. It's great. This is a wonderful technology. Better than any others. Who would have guessed? It's the best technology uh, for this. And the, is it safe? Nothing is 100% safe. Anything you do to human beings walking across the street is not 100% safe, guys. We all know. But it's about as safe as walking across the street. It's pretty safe, as far as you can tell. Maybe they're going to be, you know, there are a few people who've been hospitalized. A couple of people have had to be intubated uh, because of uh, adverse reactions. But that's like one in a million. Um, so it happens. This is the right technology for the right problem. Uh, and uh, God bless them. Yeah. Uh, yeah, actually, I think the take-up rate in Singapore is, is, is pretty respectable. And I think with uh, increasing time, more and more people are coming around to, to the fact that this is something good. The issue is going to be uh, the variants. Mm -hmm. The lore for these viruses, they didn't change so much. That was wrong. And from the very beginning, I was very worried about the coronaviruses because they come back every year. And if you study them, the same four viruses come back every four years and the same clades, in fact, 
infect the same people, sometimes four times in six years. And it looks just like the flu comes and goes, comes and goes. We didn't know exactly why that was, but there's two reasons for flu and there's two reasons for coronaviruses. One, immunity doesn't last that long. Now that's an unsolved problem. Why with polio, does even the inactivated virus that lasts almost a lifetime, 10 years anyway, and why for these viruses, it fades really quickly. That's a puzzle. And will it fade as quickly for the vaccines? We don't know the answer to that, but I can tell you from natural infections, the immunity doesn't last very long and the virus changes. And to think this virus doesn't change as fast as flu is wrong. It changes as fast as flu. And when it changes, it does three things. It becomes more transmissible, mostly because it is more avid for the receptor. That's dangerous for kids, because the reason the earlier ones didn't get kids is they didn't have as many receptors. When you have a virus that's much more avid for the receptors, it gets people with fewer receptors. And once it's in your body, it gets to places it might not have gotten before. So that's the second thing, it's often more virulent. We're used to thinking of viruses as losing virulence over time. These are at least right now gaining virulence. And it evades the immune response. And it evades it very well. Uh, people are saying, they're looking at it, the very peak bolus of antibodies following infection and saying, oh, it's only about a third or two thirds or tenfold down. And if we have a high enough antibody level, we're going to protect it. Well, guess what? Antibody levels fall. We all know that. They fall over time and they can fall, fall pretty fast, whether the half-life is a month or three months. And it's falling. And the difference between the parent and the wild type and the, and the variant gets bigger and eventually it disappears. And in some cases, it's not very good to begin with. So these variants are a real public health hazard. They are a hazard for our children and they are not going to be entirely prevented by vaccines. And the virus, I've studied these variants in great detail. I'm looking all over the world for what the variants are. They differ. There's about five or six different ways this virus is doing what it's doing. And sometimes they've recombined. So they get the worst of both worlds. So we're gonna have a long-term problem uh, with these variants that the vaccines are gonna to have to play catch up. Now the current hope is we're gonna get such high titers in some of our vaccines that it's gonna protect us for a year or two. And that may be true. We may be able to do that, but that has to be our goal because a very high titer is less active for the variants, but it's still active enough. So the higher the tighter, the longer period of protection you're going to get. So the goal now is not to do whack-a-mole where you have a hundred different variants you're trying to, 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 to get, but to get very, very high neutralizing titers. And that's what people are trying to do now. I think that's probably a rational and a very sound strategy rather than making type specifics because by the time you make this type, there'll be type two, type three, type four, type five, which is already happening. Very true. Thank you very much for that insight and see how, how time has flown by. Actually, we're at uh, 9 p.m. already. We've done this for an hour. We probably can go for another hour. There's so many uh, uh, other questions, uh, good questions that we couldn't uh, really address uh, during this period of time. Um, so I would like to just thank everyone who have been so active in their participation and for joining us. Um, I'd like to thank um, Bill, very much for uh, sharing with us his insights. I think we've learned a, a number of very important things uh, from his address and the discussion, uh, which is that um, academia or academic healthcare uh, center system, which focuses on the triple mission of uh, excellent clinical care uh, research, as well as uh, education, medical education, is, is key. Uh, and to attain that um, out outcome, that kind of perfect storm, so to speak, you actually need a, a number of important components, good leadership, uh, alignment of, um, uh, of mission and thinking, um, the use of data to provide very um, objective way of uh, measurement so that you know uh, what is going on in the entire uh, system, where the gaps are, where the performance are good and not. Uh, and also um, the alignment of thinking at the board level uh, because investment uh, fundraising may be needed uh, to push things uh, in, in new directions. And I think uh, uh, some of the benefit of having such uh, academic health system come to the fore 
in crisis like a pandemic such as, as the COVID uh, pandemic. And as he has highlighted, NYU Langone's continue to excel uh, in this pandemic setting as well. And I think these are lessons for all of us to digest uh, and, and also think how we can apply them to our own uh, setting. For those answers that we could, the questions that we couldn't answer, uh, we will uh, try to address them via email. Um, and uh, the team that organized uh, this webinar will reach out uh, with, with those uh, answers to the participants as well. So with that, thank you all very much and uh, have a good uh, evening.